Hello, and thank you for being part of this taped interview, which is part of Bio News Service's official coverage of Ectrims 2017. So, uh, results from the CARE MS trials and uh, extension study showed that Lumtrada significantly reduced MRI lesions and slowed braid volume loss in patients with active relapsing remitting MS. Uh, uh, particularly, I'm speaking about those who switched from interferon rebif. Uh, a new extension study called TOPAS is uh, further evaluating the long term effects of Lemtrada. Uh, and they found that improvements seen in MRI lesions and brain volume loss were sustained over five years. And the Lemtrada also uh, demonstrated durable uh, efficacy in the absence of continuous treatment with around 61% of patients receiving no further treatment. So has uh, Sanofi uh, explored the mechanisms that could explain uh, how or why it is effective long term in the absence of treatment or further treatment? I think so. Let me start by introducing myself. So my name is Aaron Boster. I'm the Systems Medical Chief of Neuroimmunology at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I have been uh, involved in these trials uh, and I, I seek out this long-term data because it's the most useful information as we care for patients in the real world. So this year's uh, edition of now learning about seven-year extension data uh, is, is really, really critical and we take care of patients over decades. And so a two-year clinical trial doesn't really cut it. Today, uh, your question is fascinating uh, and it speaks to this unusual mechanism of action. How is it possible that you could treat someone, wait a year, treat them again, and now they're going out years and they don't need to be treated, and yet they have all these amazing outcomes with slowing the rates of brain atrophy, decreasing the T2 lesion burden, annualized relapse rates that are less than 0.2. I mean, this is weird, right? And I think it has everything to do with the mechanism of how Lemtrada reboots or rewrites the immune response. For starters, it's lymphoablative. And what I mean by that is, you have all these different white blood cells, and we're selecting only adult B and T cells, essentially. And that's unique. So this is not a pan-immunosuppressant like napalm. You know, we're not doing that. It's, it's very, very targeted. And that's not exciting in and of itself. You knock those cells out, but when they grow back, they grow back differently. In the nascent MS patient, there's an imbalance in the inflammatory cells and these T cells. You have a bunch of bar brawlers and very few cops. I'm talking about TH17, inflammatory phenotypes, and more, um, more helper T cells that are more anti-inflammatory. There's an imbalance, the T regulatory cells. And when you give Lemtrada and you lymphoblate both populations, when they grow back, you grow back more cops and less robbers. You change the behavior of the cell lines. And so that the T regulatory cells are more robust, there's more of them, they're more active, Right? And that resets the immune response. These new adult B and T cells are behaving differently. And that's why I think we can see a durable effect that goes on for presumably years in the absence of retreatment. That's very interesting. So uh, among these uh, patients who did not uh, require more treatment in the, in the study, how did they perceive Lentrada? Uh, did the treatment have any major effects on their quality of life and disability levels? When you have to invent language to explain a phenomenon, I think you're onto something. And we have now embraced new terms like confirmed disability improvement. Now in the clinical trial that's defined operationally as an exam that improves by a point for at least six months. That in and of itself is revolutionary. Although, I'll share with you uh, that, the, that it goes far above and beyond that, and I'd like to give you an example if I may. I have a patient uh, who is a young physician, and her MS was severe. When she developed MS, the first thing she had to do was throw away all of her shoes. She was very fond of high heels, she told me, and she was so ataxic that she had to wear flat shoes and hold on to the wall. She couldn't close her eyes to kiss her husband because she'd fall over, and she had to wear a depend undergarment because she would be fecally incontinent in the hospital. Right? This is this young physician trying to succeed. She receives Lumtrada. She's never had a problem with bowels ever since then. She can close her eyes and kiss her husband. She's running a mile a day, limited by heat sensitivity. And when I ask her, 
what improvements are the most remarkable for you? She says, something that only girls would appreciate. That's what she tells me. She says, I now wear two-inch heels. That is improvement. That's very, very meaningful. Can I just ask, uh, and you find this, that one example that extrapolates well toward the patient group, uh, Population. The reason I bring this up is that, number one, we're talking about a, a subset of population that were on interferon and then switched, all right? So they were on interferon for two years and this still passed. And then they went on alemtuzumab and we have five years of information. That mirrors my patient population. The American label it, it places alemtuzumab after other drugs, right? So I do think that it's very, very appropriate. The point that I'm trying to convey here is, what's improvement to a human being? What really makes them improve isn't necessarily captured adequately, even with these, with these new measures. Um, let me give you another example. A young man who is a very disgruntled engineer, a little bit gruff at times, very, very mad at me every visit because he has Lermite's phenomena. He bends his neck and he has electric shocks down his legs. And he has dysesthetic pain, his feet burn. And every visit he says, make it stop. Seven years, make it, I can't make it stop. I showed him his spinal cord lesions. I showed him the damage. I said, this is permanent. He received alentuzumab. And he comes back to see me at month six. And he says, you, sir, are a liar. Why am I a liar? He said, you're a liar because I'm normal. It went away. He improved. Now, would that be captured in the EDSS? A little bit. But the impact of his life, the quality of his life, has dramatically changed in a way that is subtle and yet terribly meaningful. I do think that it's analogous. So, uh, based on what you, you tell me, are you working with um, developing better patient-centered outcome measures? So, I think in the real world, we have to, we have to, we have to meet the patient where they are. Um, in our clinical practice, we use several attempts at trying to understand the patient. The most important is listening. We do that both in the classic clinical sense. We also use several patient reported outcome measures. These are measures similar to what was used in the clinical trials. And they're validated screening measures to look into fatigue and sleep and, and things of this ilk. We also use several validated measures uh, to look at function in the clinic, not dissimilar from the trials. The nine hole peg test, the timed 25 foot walk, the simple digit modality, low contrast visual acuity. These are standard in our, in our practice for all patients because we have to cast a broad net. Uh, I, I think uh, to, to only look at a simple measure like EDSS is to miss the big picture. And we can't miss the big picture here. It's too important. Among, among the patients that uh, did need additional treatment, uh, patients could be treated either with Lemtrada or other disease-modifying therapies. So which other therapies were used in, in this group? So we don't have the specifics at hand of all the different ones. There's a little bit of Tysabri, a little bit of pills, and some of them went back to first-line injections. I think the key point for me is that it was less than 9%. The vast majority of people didn't need retreated, as, as you pointed out earlier. And some people opted to take a third course of alemtuzumab, which to me makes a lot of sense conceptually. Some people went back to shots, and they went back to pills, and they went back to other therapies. And if there's a key take home, it's that you can go back to another therapy. And it will save. Yes. This does not close the door. As we talked about, we rewrite the immune response. The drug leaves your body in a month. The effects are long term. And I would submit to you that the MS is changed. And that if, in fact, you were to go to a different therapy, you might find an easier time of controlling the disease process because of the mechanism of alentuzumab has changed the milieu in the immune system it's very safe to do that. So do you know what, what distinguishes the people that uh, did or did not need further treatment? So the way that the clinical trial was constructed uh, has largely been adopted in clinical practice, and that is you receive your first five doses, we call that the first course, and then a year later you have three doses, we call that the second course, and that's everyone's going to do that. At that point, moving forward prospectively, if a patient were to have a clinical relapse, or, and, if they had two new spots on MRI, that would qualify them for discussion about option for retreatment. And that's when we would talk about, do you want a third course, or are we gonna consider something different? We have adopted that approach in clinical practice, and I find that it's very appropriate. But did you study uh, 
patient or disease characteristics at the beginning of the trial that could explain uh, the difference between the those who responded or not, or who remained stable? Brilliant question. Don't have an answer yet. It's an excellent question, and you uh, are, are you have your finger on the pulse of where we are with this. We don't know the answer just yet. Um, we would love to know the answer. You know, when you look at uh, this, this cohort of patients in Topaz, at year seven, so five years after, 75% have stable or approved exams. 25% have some progression maybe, right? And 25% show uh, improvements. So, so it's not everybody. And to your point, if I could figure out who they were ahead of time, wow, that'd be great. We're still working on that. So uh, we've been speaking a lot about uh, Lentrada's efficacy. Uh, what about side effects? Lentrada is known to cause some serious side effects, and uh, it can only be used in patients who tried, as you as you mentioned before, uh, at least uh, two more uh, MS drugs. So, were there any serious uh, adverse events in the extension study? So uh, you're making reference to the way the American label was written, which is actually different from the way the drug was studied and approved. And so in the trials, we put patients on it first line in CARMS-1 and second line in CARMS-2. Much to my chagrin, the American label uses a, a, a two-step two edit. Um, and so I just want to make that point of clarification, if I may. Um, it's exciting to know that when you look at this long-term cohort, there's no new safety signal. And so what we learned last year, when we had six-year data, is the same as what we know now at seven-year data. And it's brilliant, the consistency of the side effect profile has not increased. I love knowing that. In fact, infusion reactions, which is the largest cadre of side effects, diminishes with subsequent infusions. That is to say, after your second course, your third course, statistically, you're less likely to have infusion reactions. And I like knowing that. There's no new signal, and that's information that I will immediately take back to Columbus, Ohio to share with my patients. It's reassuring to know that as we move forward in time, we don't pick up new scary stuff. So um, you may not uh, um, want or be able to answer this, but do you think this information will uh, lead to a change in the label? I, it's not that I don't want to, but I don't know. Um, hope springs eternal. And the fact that in America, we are relegated to using this most amazing therapy, third line, breaks my heart. Uh, there are enlightened countries around the world where the opportunity to apply it earlier is available. Um, and I, I regret that I can't. Um, will it result in a label change? I don't know. Um, I think the data is pretty loud. Uh, and I think that it would be wonderful if regulatory bodies looked at it. Um, but that's above my pay grade. Thank you. Um, so, is there uh, anything else that you would like to add or further emphasize? I went into this uh, field, I decided to do it when I was 12 because I had a family member with MS. And I watched him languish and die without therapy, there wasn't any therapy at that time. And early in my career, I essentially told people, I think I can make you get worse slower. That was the quality of the drugs that we had at the time. We could slow down the uh, irreparable damage. I never in my life thought that I would talk to you about confirmed disability improvement. I never thought that I would talk to you about keeping someone stable without retreating them. This is a game changer. This is transformative. And it's so exciting to know now, seven years out, it just keeps getting better. I'm very, very excited about this therapy and what it does to the field and what it offers for people. So, where do you see treatment in 10 years from now? 10 years from now, I think that we will look a lot like oncologists. I think that we will look a lot like rheumatologists. I think that in those two fields, uh, they're a bit ahead of us in their thought processes and their approach to treating patients. In both cases, they have learned the earlier and the harder you treat, the better the human being does. And this escalation model that is all too often used in MS is frankly inappropriate, in my opinion. Because if I put you on something, and then we see what happens, and it doesn't work out, we escalate. What does it doesn't work out mean? 
It means irreparable drain damage that I can't give you back. I don't want to play that game. And I don't think that I have to because of products like this that allow me to consider other options. Thank you so much for uh, speaking to us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.